Welcome back to Movies on TV Podcast Industries. We're here with our spoiler-filled discussion of Birds of Prey and the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn. Or as it's known now, Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey. Welcome back, movie fans. This is Movies on TV Podcast Industries. We're here talking about Harley Quinn uh, in her movie, was known as Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn, and is now known as Harley Quinn Birds of Prey. But it will be spoiler-filled, and I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow movie boffins. I am one of your other hosts, John. (laughs) And rounding out the trio of our Birds of Prey, I am Chris. And also, I'm a big fan of SEO, so I approve the change in the I title. wasn't going to be able to fit this into the name of the episode, <laughs> so I'm really glad that there's no and or the in there as well, so it's quite happy. Just do really small tanks. <laughs> That's not how it works, it's the number of letters, John, as I've been learning over the years, uh, learning SEO as well. But SEO is not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about our spoiler-filled discussion of Birds of Prey, the new movie from DC. Go. <laughs> Buffy oh. and cawing. I like it. I like it. I'm expecting like Assassin's Creed actually, where it's just a screech at the bird of prey. And then I jump off the building, <laughs> but don't land anywhere near superhero landing. Yeah, superhero. yeah exactly. Oh, I just, just land on my back legs. and go ow. Not as graceful as Altair then, unfortunately. No, no. <laughs> or a splat. Hopefully not, because we need you for the rest of the episode, John. So please do not jump out any windows. Um, Hopefully you've seen the movie Harley Quinn. If you haven't seen it yet, run out and see it. Uh, Guys, overall, what did you think of this movie? Uh, Before we get into any kind of spoiler-filled discussion, just an overview of what you thought of this movie. Is it worth people going to see, Chris? Fantabulous. It's a great R-rated romp of fun. I saw it 24 hours ago now, still thinking Mm -hmm. about it. I'm still enjoying parts of it, still giggling at other parts of it. Um, is it DCEU or is it just DCU now? Who knows? It's, it's one of the best, um, films in that genre right now of the, or that category of mm-hmm. DC films. Um, definitely top. I think two. they just call them live action DC films. They've never committed to that DCEU. That's very much a Marvel fan thing isn't it where we used to watch mcu movies because they're all connected whereas dc are very happy to put out a movie like joker last year oscar winning joker now um they're very happy to put out a movie like that and then put out a movie like harley quinn not connected at all uh not even the same character but uh there's some connections to other movies that have happened in the past as we'll talk about i'm sure when we get into the episode yeah good stuff i'm all for dc on that Mm -hmm. well done what did you think overall on this one john should people run it and see this one i think so i mean it's just a good romp um you know and it's a good R-rated romp as well. It's it's brash, which is what Harley Quinn is. Mm-hmm. It's good fun. It moves along at pace. The story is really short, but the way they do it, actually, with flashbacks and all this kind of stuff, is really interesting. Mm-hmm. I really like that. Um, and, you know, Margot Robbie is, is just a great portrayal of Harley Quinn in this. Yeah. She, she's great. It's bubblegum with a massive mallet that could come swinging for your jaw at any moment. It's great. On roller derby roller skates. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Uh-huh. exactly. Uh, any thoughts, guys? The This movie hasn't opened hugely in the US, and I was thinking about it. You know, about 50% of fans of comic book movies are female fans, right? And this is a, definitely a female-led movie directed by Kathy Yan, a female director, written by Christina Hodgson, a, a female writer. Any idea why it may not have uh, sold that well to the audience in the US? Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know. There's, there's probably whole host of things maybe they're glued to the democratic race at the moment <laughs> i have no idea um but it's doing well internationally mm-hmm. and i think good on it um it may have its audience internationally rather than in the u.s mm-hmm. so um i'm sure dc are gonna like from a purely financial point make their money back yep. but for sure um maybe it's just the time of year um maybe with the snow in the northeast and northwest they can't get out to the cinema or something who knows yeah and the reason i'm saying it is because the name has been changed as i've referenced already the name has been changed in this movie to harley quinn birds of prey Uh, i personally think birds of prey are quite small 
characters they're not known that well outside of people that watch the co- watch the cartoons and people that watch uh, read comic books um so i i kind of feel people will be going to the cinema going what's that movie again the one with harley quinn in it oh i don't know maybe it's not showing here i'll go and see something else <laughs> you know so maybe just changing that title and that word of mouth getting out there about go and see the harley quinn movie after people have seen the first weekend might boost it in the second weekend they are going up against sonic the hedgehog this weekend so, <laughs> so it should do very well Sorry, well mm, that's that's reviewing crazy well, which is interesting. This film reviewed crazy well, mm-hmm. but you're right. I was calling it the Harley Quinn film, mm-hmm. and I know Birds of Prey. Yeah. I know who they are and what they do, and I've known about them for years, and still, it's the Harley Quinn film. Um, I additionally think some people potentially feel burnt by Justice League, mm-hmm. and people also then burnt by Suicide Squad. Yeah. Even though Margot Robbie and the whole host of... All the actors, actresses have come out and said, no, no, it's not connected. You don't need to have seen Suicide Squad to to understand this. But there is a level to that as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a lot of things. I do think it will do very well this week because Valentine's Day. Right. Valentine's Day is always a big cinema night Mm -hmm. weekend for people. If they can get some of the right marketing done in the next couple of days, you'll have... The partner, people going, oh, let's go to the cinema. What do you want to see? Comic book lovers will go, okay, let's go see Birds of Prey. And their partners who aren't a comic book fan will go, oh, well, okay. Well, it's, I, I've heard good things. Yeah. And I liked Harley Quinn, Margot Robbie. So yeah, let's go see. So it will probably see a surge because the other option is let's go to the cinema. What do you want to see? Well, this is Hedgehog that runs really fast <laughs> and Jim Carrey's in it. Yeah. It's live action, the CGI, and the thing looks really weird. Do you want to do that? No. No. <laughs> no, we don't. No, we don't. That's it. That's the spoiler free part of our discussion on this. Um, go out and see the movie is pretty much what all three of us are saying. We're going to talk yeah. about this for a little while. We're going to get in depth on the movie. So if you haven't seen it, this is the time to pause us and come back to us afterwards. We'll be talking in full detail about it. If you want to hear more of what we do, make sure you subscribe to us over on tvpodcastindustries.com. You can hear any of our podcasts about any of the shows that we're covering. We're currently covering Star Trek Picard. Soon we'll be going in depth into Penny Dreadful, uh, another show that we've loved in the past, leading up to the brand new fourth season of Penny Dreadful called Penny Dreadful City of Angels. So um, we're going all over the place in some interesting ways with our TV podcasting. Exactly. We've also had The Witcher. And before that, Watchmen. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, if you want to catch those out, go on to any good or evil podcast catcher of your choice. Uh, you can check out some of the options over on our website at tvpodcastindustries.com. Mm-hmm. You can also help keep the lights on by going to patreon.com slash tvpodcastindustries and by tossing us a dollar if you like what we do and help keep, as I said, the lights on, the podcast mic going, and more importantly, the internet connection so we can upload our audio vocal platitudes directly into your ears. (laughs) You can also share your puddin's love by sharing the podcast, (laughs) throwing us a like, or also just a nice review. Five stars always goes down well mm-hmm. on Valentine's Day. Right. You're back from the cinema. You've seen the movie. You know how crazy it is. We're actually going to probably break how they showed the story in the movie. And we're probably going to go this a bit more linearly than it's done in the film. Because it is told in a non-linear fashion. Very similar to like a Quentin Tarantino movie or that kind of movie where uh, something happens and then you flash back a little while and the story's told in a different way. But enough of that. Derek, do you want to give us some production details? Absolutely, yes. This movie was directed by Kathy Yan. This is only her second full-length feature film after her 2018 dark comedy, Dead Pigs. I really need to watch that, actually, after watching this movie. I'm really excited to see what else she's done in the past. Uh, that's quite cool that uh, that she's done just one movie and then gets a massive DC movie, isn't it? Well, I'd love to know what the subject matter of Dead Pigs uh, is, actually. I'm assuming poor sign and death just... Going out on a limb. They probably go well. Yeah, exactly. Or it's a really bad take on our our law enforcement. But uh, who knows? (laughs) Who knows? Who knows? It could be a documentary uh, about making bacon. Maybe, maybe. Uh, but the movie was written by Christina Hodson. Uh, most well-known recently, she wrote the uh, Bumblebee movie, the best Transformers movie since the whole series began. Maybe even the best. Uh, one of the entire series uh, i definitely remember fondly watching the first movie getting quite excited about it and then getting to the end of it and going 
I haven't actually seen any robots. There's a lot of metal hitting each other <laughs> over and over again. Whereas Bumblebee kind of took it back to a really good storyline. It was really good fun actually to watch. Yeah, Bumblebee was great. Loved it. Mm-hmm. Also probably important to note that this movie was produced by Margot Robbie and her her whole production company was involved in getting this to the screen. This is something that it was a passion project for her to f- do a follow up to Suicide Squad starring Harley Quinn because she really does enjoy playing the character. So, uh, so quite cool that she's the one that's kind of brought this out of the gates in, into DC world, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think um, fair dues to old Margot for, for doing it because I think you really do get that sense that she enjoys playing this character for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the whole team are the birds of prey. It's just kind of a nice misfit grouping, which is is really good. Uh, and, and good to have back on the screen, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend any of our listeners uh, check out, just literally Google Margot Robbie on YouTube, interview Birds of Prey. She did one I know with Jimmy Fallon. She's done a couple with uh, like Seth Meyers and things like that while she was doing the circuit last week. Mm-hmm. And she's told the story of everyone was like, oh, yeah, like this is taking a while to get into she She's actively said, yeah, well, like she started pitching this directly after Suicide Squad. Mm-hmm. Um, and essentially it was an uphill battle. She makes the joke of like, yeah, uh, a female written and directed, produced by a female all-star female cast, uh, about the bir- female birds of prey team and me, no joker. Um, it's been an uphill battle. And she was like, I mean, she was very actively open, but mm-hmm. she's like, she's so happy about how it came together and she's Definitely. so happy. Um, I was going to say, it's not like she doesn't have any skin in the game. Obviously, she does. Mm-hmm. She is not only the executive producer, but yeah. she's the star. But actually, more than that, as John said, she she enjoys the role. Mm-hmm. And actually, to me, she's starting to become as kind of iconic in the role as as you would assume, like as Mark Hamill as the Joker. Mm-hmm. That take on it is now becoming potentially the the most well-known. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm delighted that she's brought this back to the screen. It didn't quite take as long as Deadpool coming to the screen, 10 years of, uh, right. of work. <laughs> um, this was this was four or five years, but they had film, film proof that Margot Robbie played a great Harley Quinn and nobody really had any complaints about her as Harley Quinn. I think what a lot of people had a complaint about is just the general relationship between Harley Quinn and Joker. So kind of a good choice here to kind of break break that off as this movie kicks off. Uh, generally, just a, an overview of the cast that we have here. Harley Quinn's played by Margot Robbie. Uh, Rene Montoya, played by Rosie Perez. Great to see her back in cinema again. Uh, Huntress is played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The crossbow killer. Not the Huntress, it's the crossbow killer. <laughs> but yeah, she is played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead. They call her the Huntress, she says to many, many people. She calls herself the Huntress. <laughs> no, hang on. No, no, I think you've both got it wrong. It's Helena Bertinelli. <laughs> true, true. Do you know, I love the tick she has in the movie where she keeps saying to people, do you know who I am? And then shooting them before they can realize who she is. <laughs> <laughs> the crossbow killer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Huntress. Anyway, uh, go back to the rest of the cast. Cassandra Kane, uh, played by Ella J. Basco. Uh, Black Canary. Uh, Diana Lance, played by Journey Smollett-Bell, uh, who does all her own singing in the movie as well. A beautiful voice. Uh, some great moments yeah. where she does, where she is the, the proper canary singing in the club. Uh, of Roman Sionis, the other big cast member in the movie, Ewan McGregor, a Scottish actor putting on a great American accent and really enjoying himself with this movie. Yeah, definitely. Um, and he, he brings that menace as well because... The, there is that moment in his club where he is effectively degrading one of mm. his female patrons. And it's uh, it's a really interesting pop out of ultimately what is a massively sort of roller coaster ride, fun, uh, extravagant, colorful and um, dark humored yeah. uh movie um but it, it's really interesting it's a great take mm-hmm. that moment particularly definitely gave me the impetus to want this character dead by the end of the film um that moment where you realize this is just an overprivileged kid basically who's grown up in a family has all the money in the world and is treating everybody around him like crap and has been getting away with it over and over again because of his sidekick victor zaz uh, who if anybody knows batman if anybody knows 
the villains of Batman. Victor Zaz is the crazy one who just kills because he loves killing. Um, we have Chris Messina playing him uh, in this role. Can I just go back to our Gotham TV podcast days and say I really do wish we had Anthony Carrigan reprising his role as Victor Zaz because he makes a much better Zaz than Chris Messina does. I absolutely loved his version of Zaz on the small Definitely. screen. I wish he'd made the jump to the big screen. That just doesn't ha- often happen in, in DC, unfortunately. Yeah, I think Victor just didn't pop in this. Um, the, the take on, on the on the character Victor Zaz, it just didn't pop uh, in the same way that Anthony Carrigan sort of captured the nutty, mm-hmm. psychotic craziness. Um, Guy with likes to fun. Have fun, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, let's see what did pop. John, do you want to give us the synopsis for Birds of Prey? And the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn. Sure. Harley Quinn puts the finishing touches to her relationship with the Joker by blowing up Ace Chemicals where her story began. This drunken act lifts the protection of the clown prince of crime that she has enjoyed for years. To save herself, Harley agrees to find the Bertinelli diamond for a crazed, black mask-wearing businessman, Roman Sionis. She quickly finds out that a young thief, Cassandra Kane, has hidden the priceless diamond by swallowing it. While they wait for the laxatives, prune juice and chilies to take effect, Detective Rennie Montoya, Black Canary and Huntress all track them down to help Cassandra from the bounty on her head. As Roma Sionis bears down with an army of mercenaries, the five ladies form a tentative pact to rid Gotham City of this sleazebag. I suppose the first thing I want to pop up before we get into our kind of top five talking points about this movie first thing i want to pop up this is harley quinn this is her movie and then eventually we get to the point where the birds of prey are formed at the end of the film but i must admit i was very surprised that this group didn't get together until that kind of final moment it seemed like an an odd way to sell your film based on these characters some of them not appearing on screen together until those last couple of minutes uh for that final battle i just thought it was kind of interesting where i was going hang on a second are we seeing any more of these other characters interacting at all um but fun nonetheless yeah i mean i just took that because they were so different you know one's on a revenge mission um helena bertinelli you've got a detective of the gcpd um, which is not a natural fit for uh, Harley Quinn. Uh, and then someone who technically is working for Roman Sionis. So it is a disparate sort of uneasy grouping, mm-hmm. uh, but through different strands of uh, Harley's fractured kind of mind, uh, which of course is our point number one, they, they kind of come together, mm-hmm. which is good. Chris, do you want to kick us off with our point number one? The storytelling of this movie is the fractured mind of Harley Quinn. Really, that she's the narrator for the film. Uh, We kick off with a cartoon intro. Um, Another great surprise where we have this voiceover from Harley Quinn. I actually thought they were going to take all this stuff from the cartoon itself. Uh, Completely different art style and completely different from the cartoon uh, in the opening bit. What did you think of the the fractured storytelling throughout this movie? So I loved it. Um, for me, it, it, it tells that fantabulous mindscape that is Harley Quinn's mm-hmm, definitely. brain. So y- th- this kind of fractured storytelling directly leads to her, the way that she would tell a story, the way she does tell a story. Mm-hmm. And like, it really does connect you to Harley and Quinzel. Mm-hmm. It, it's like, it, cause you get that, the PhD, psychologist and very lucid and telling a correct story Mm -hmm. and then you get harley quinn who literally is scattered yeah and kind of goes everywhere so this cartoon opening was fantastic because i didn't know how they were going to comment up to a lot of parts of it Mm -hmm. so like because yeah not everyone's gonna have seen suicide squad yeah so they catch you up on everything very quickly not everyone's going to know the 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 birth of Harley Quinn mm-hmm. so they have to kind of put that in um it, and i really enjoyed it like you get the backstory very quickly mm-hmm. uh, but then you get thrown into okay here's me telling a story well actually do you know what i'm going to tell this story we're going to tell it my way and we're going to start at this point first yeah and then it's like, oh no, 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 wait, no, wait. I'm actually I need to go back and explain this other bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because that's how you tell a story to a friend usually. 
unless you're like an like a very accredited storyteller, mm-hmm. you're talking to your friend, you're telling a story. The one thing I, I know we'll probably get to the end in a while, but I was expecting at the very last scene mm-hmm. for her to be talking to someone and telling the story. Oh, really? <laughs> like I thought it was going to be that very much Deadpool like bit where she closes a book mm-hmm. or she's talking to Poison Ivy, right? Or she's speaking to the big bat, mm-hmm. and it's just like you don't see it; you just see kind of like someone from behind. And I think that's kind of the fun thing about about this movie, though that that it it is probably Harley telling the story to herself. <laughs> you know, she's kind of yeah. she is that fracture that she's probably telling her own origin story out loud to herself, but she's also talking to the audience as well. Uh, I, I must say it. It kind of seeking directly into her going on that epic bender after breaking up with her pudding with Joker. You know, we never get to see uh, Jared Leto's version of the Joker. Not even the cartoon version looks anything like Jared Leto's version of the Joker. Um, he played him in Suicide Squad, in case you haven't seen that film, but you've probably seen that version of Joker in at least uh, one or two memes on the internet. Um, but I, I kind of love that it just moved into this massively difficult breakup you think that harley quinn's absolutely fine (laughs) she's grand and then she's drinking 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 throwing up in people's handbags smashing stuff in the in cyanus's club uh breaking the driver's legs i remember sitting in the cinema with you john watching it and that was the first moment john just absolutely (laughs) winced as these two pairs of legs just split in half basically as she jumps off it's it's that it's that image of the knee going in the opposite direction mm-hmm. from yeah. from where you know how it's designed, and I was just like, I just winced. Uh, but um, what a great kind of um, sort of fight in Sionis's club. Mm. Um, but yeah, I love this fractured mind. I, it just plays to who Harley is. It's kind of, and then she gets distracted yep. because exactly. um, of of whatever. Um, but there is a method to her madness as she takes you through this story in this fractured way. Um, I mean, even just the, the fact that you kind of have that flashback of only four minutes, which (laughs) I thought was hilarious. Um, Four minutes. You know, it's just, it's just a nice little gag uh, in there. And there's so much kind of going on you do kind of have to keep pace with it because mm-hmm. she, she's going back here you get going back there you know we have um sort of the 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 history of uh bertinelli diamond and the family and mm-hmm. the connections and what kind of roman Sionis is doing as well that pieces it all together yeah so you know she's massively in the know um but i i loved uh i loved the the flashback just before where she puts she, she's surrounded by Sarnas's men after um, the word has gone out that um, she no longer has the protection of the Joker and she just raises the white flag and goes, parlay? <laughs> um, I just really like that. Yep. Um, just delivered. So, so funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was great. And that egg sandwich to be a driver for um, the movie yeah, <laughs> uh, was... Really good. And, you know, um, despite some of the things that seem to have gone in it, I kind of agree. I was like, going, that looks gorgeous. It does look oh, amazing. Yeah. Oh, I was, I was, I was like, salivating. Yeah. <laughs> it is amazing. I love her description of it at the end where she goes, I don't know if it's the stray Armenian arm hair or that cheese <laughs> that's six months ahead of date, but it is the best sandwich I've ever tasted. <laughs> Fabulous. It looks um, so tasty. <laughs> it did. It really did. Uh, but I love I love the flow through again. Uh, you know, she is drunk all the way through this this bender at Sionis's club, and then she makes this decision to go up and blow up Ace Chemicals. Again, any Batman fan or anybody that has known anything about the Joker, most of his origin stories feature ace chemicals and that transferred into the origin of harley quinn as well so both of these characters being created in ace chemicals for most of the stories some other there's some other origin stories as well out there um but i love this iconic location being blown up and effectively turning into fireworks again you're wondering whether this is just in harley quinn's mind that these fireworks are going off or is it actually there uh, on location and are the actual fireworks going off as this place explodes you know uh, it's very likely it's just going on in her head uh, but it does lead her into going you know i, I make my best decisions when i'm drunk and then the <laughs> aftermath the following morning is her going for the perfect egg sandwich because she needs to take care of that hangover she now has 
But again, it, it's like her attack on the GCPD where she's trying to go and get Cassandra mm-hmm. from the cell. And I just love the the color powder and the glitter Fabulous. coming out of her gun. Um, and, and in fact, the gun's probably a damn sight safer than um, her fighting because like, some of those cops uh, got a pretty rough deal once she ran out of uh, ammo. Mm-hmm. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. I prefer to have been shot by um, the glitter. That would have been quite nice. I would have looked fabulous on my deathbed. <laughs> or if I needed foundation uh, to go on a night out and the powder would have just caked on a nice kind of foundation, a, a, you know, a blue, a hint of blue, a hint of red. Is, would have been good. Is that like Homer's uh, makeup shotgun from the Simpsons? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just loved all this part of it. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. not even going to lie. It's just like, the, I know you said, yes, those explosions could have been in her head and they may well have been. But for me, it was just the, 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 the choice to do that glittery, those, the, the fireworks. Mm-hmm. It fit into the, that neon-y um, look and feel, the choice by the director to mm-hmm. make it yeah. that way. Um, the cinematographer, I should say. Sorry, apologies. It just that art style, it just all blended so well. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, people have seen, you know, TV shows like Gotham went on for 100 episodes and it's seen as this dark, dank city. We've seen the Dark Knight movies with uh, with Christian Bale and Christopher Nolan uh, working together and doing this really dark city, gritty city. But you can imagine it in this crazy mind of Harley Quinn. In her mind, everything's full of lights because she's able to go and steal whatever she wants to. And she has the protection of the Joker. And she's kind of able to do whatever she wants to in the city. So it's kind of like a playground for her at times. And that's why I'm thinking that these explosions, especially because you hear the noises of firecrackers and stuff going off. So you're probably thinking that's part of her little uh, part of her own little uh, brain chemistry that's doing that. One thing I did love about the choice for Harley Quinn in this movie, I love that you see or hear her psychiatrist persona coming through quite often. She tends to analyze everybody around her uh, in her psychiatric speak, where she's effectively going, you know, that's a childhood trauma uh, waiting to happen kind of thing. You know? <laughs> yeah. As she's talking to people and going, oh, well, I know your daddy left you. I don't need the speech. I know that you just want to take over. That's, a, that's a, a, an ill-timed or an ill-judged way to do your plan. I don't need to hear any of that. All, all I want to do is get out of here, you know? Uh, I love that she uses all of her knowledge uh, in this movie because she hasn't really been like that before uh, in movies and in, and in cartoons. It's, she hasn't really had that side of things. She does have it in the comics that the character has evolved quite significantly uh, when written by a good writer. Um, but I think she's written by a good writer here. 100%. And those moments not only lead to comedic value, mm-hmm. so that there is that point in the third act when they're in the, the room and she kind of just butts in with that speech mm-hmm. or that that piece and then goes, should we get burritos after this? <laughs> and it's just, yeah. it, it leads to that humor. Yeah. But at the same time, as you said, it, it evolves the character outside of my little pudding. Like, mm-hmm. oh, it just like, I, it really just rounds out fleshes and also evolves the character that we know if you've read the, some of these great comic books, mm-hmm. that, that it's a very strong character with really good emotional depth. I'll, I'll, I'll give a great example as well, is if anyone hasn't seen it, the, the, ca- the cartoon, mm-hmm. Harley Quinn. Uh, it's amazing. It's Kaylee Cuckoo, uh-huh. uh, and it, it's just fantastic. Yeah. But it's the same thing where they, for a lot of people, Harley Quinn is the sidekick or the girlfriend of Joker. Mm-hmm. And in the recent years, they've expanded out on this character and really made her her own character, um, her own um, anti-hero uh, and it's just when as you said when it's written well by a great writer mm-hmm. the character just comes to life in this that yes yeah, she's a she's funny but at the same time you're like oh that's true you're a psychologist yeah and that's probably what that means exactly exactly yeah and it feels like that's always been left on the table by writers they had the opportunity to use it and they just didn't use it uh, they made the yeah. choice not to so having it on the big screen and having it out there for a more popular place, I suppose, for people to see it. You can read the comic books, of course, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people want to sit down in front of a movie for two hours and be entertained. And then that's their only impression of a character like Harley Quinn. And you'll have people going, 
Why is Oscar-nominated actress Margot Robbie interested in playing this character? Why the hell would she want to just put pigtails on and go around in roller skates? She's got so much more depth to her, and they they get there sometimes. Um, you're, you're talking about the, the cartoon. I watched four episodes of it back-to-back the other night, and it is crazy. Just, just It's not your daddy's uh, Batman animated series. I haven't heard the F word uncensored in a cartoon other than uh, South Park for a very long time, and seeing it over and over again by every character from Batman to Joker to Harley Quinn um, is quite funny as well as the leg breaking and the blood that's going on all the way throughout the show it's a really interesting watch definitely definitely recommend that one as well yeah it is it's it's really good and i think like coming to that i think the the montoya chase as well where literally everyone in gotham suddenly realizes that she isn't protected she's not underpinned mm-hmm. by the joker anymore is just really good where and and you get the the writing coming on the screen saying what their grievance with her (laughs) and uh, it's just really good but you have this moment where even the gcpd are kind of like okay we're going to go after her now because the joker's not around Mm -hmm. and detective montoya is chasing her around and there's there's a whole range of other people uh chasing her and there's just that last moment where all of them die effectively apart from montoya Mm -hmm. uh, because of a crash that goes into this and it's she's it's all just blind look and she says it it's just a great little kind of foot chase scene yeah to be honest of all these people trying to to get at harley quinn um and, and each time you get the grievance coming up although with some it's like I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> I pissed off a lot of people in this city. I also loved during the chase that she got distracted by a sparkly handbag that went really well with her uh, their jacket. It <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> just stopped for that split second too long to let uh, alcoholic Montoya catch up with her, basically. <laughs> Can we just pause for one second on our points and discuss the costumes? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. The, the, the choice, the costume designer on this was just on point yeah fantastic stuff yeah harley quinn they've evolved her out of her daddy's girl or daddy's issue one in suicide squad right uh and they've given her her full personality so she's got this fantastic yellow ensemble towards the end Mm -hmm. she's got her roly derby outfit she's got her clubbing outfit but then you even go towards montoya who is her grizzled cop uh-huh. and then she's with uh she ha- she's wearing a a loner t-shirt from uh the lost and found yep. which is <laughs> yeah, um so definitely good. interesting i shaved my balls for this literally <laughs> on her t-shirt uh or a shirt i should say uh-huh. and it's just and then like say huntress's comic accurate costume-esque mm-hmm. uh but even then like black canary when she's in her club bit and then going towards um, the later on where she, she said, they're all, they've taken that comic booky look and feel mm-hmm. to a degree to some of the costumes. And I could honestly see people wearing everything that they've worn, the kind of over the top in everyday life. I'm not saying because it's hipster, but I could see, I can honestly see a lot of people cosplaying for Halloween. Oh, without a doubt. And Absolutely. not, not doing it as like, Oh, I need to wear uh, uh, the sexy clown outfit. Mm-hmm. It's going to be. Oh no, this is a really cool one. I'm not showing off crazy amounts of cleavage. It's body positive. It's everything in between. Mm-hmm. I just loved, loved the the costume design. Yeah, really, really yeah. cool. I love they took their cues from what what has been around before and just made it into something more realistic. Absolutely, exactly yeah. as you say. Uh, let's get on to our second big point, really, because it's the team. That's in this in this movie. It's the movie is about getting this team together. Uh, Rena Montoya, you've already talked about it a little bit, but we've talked about Rena Montoya quite a lot, yeah. John, because uh, love this character yeah, right back to Gotham TV podcast days before we even started talking about the show. We were talking about the comic books where Rena Montoya was such a major character in there. Great to see her brought yeah. to the big screen and Gotham Central as well. Mm-hmm. A great set of comics that revolves around GCPD with Renny Montoya and her partner, Christmas Allen. Mm-hmm. Um, it was great to have her in a movie um, here and, uh, you know, bringing out a lot of the stuff there, you know, that she is a lesbian with and has her ex there who is, I think, a, a lawyer or district attorney. District, assistant district attorney, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You've got her alcoholism as well, which, you know, is a huge part of some of the story arcs mm-hmm. in, in her for her character 
And there's her former partner as well, who in this case isn't Crispus Allen, but has made Captain basically on the back of all her great detective work. Mm -hmm. And there is a slight hint that she can reform um, crime scenes in her head, which you've gotten from um, the comics as well, Mm -hmm. that she's kind of got this knack, this kind of superpower is not the right word but effectively uh you know a feeling for crime scenes and yeah. uh, which was really nicely played out in in the uh, italian restaurants mm-hmm. as well shut up i'm working, I'm working. <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> as her new partner is like a complete and utter dimwit who <laughs> who is like can't put anything together yeah. so i'm really just pleased as well with how rosie perez plays her i mean mm-hmm. just as you say chris her, her wearing um you know the the lost and found t-shirt with i shave my balls for this just the look on her face is mm-hmm. so so nicely done and I, I love the fact that you know she becomes part of the birds of prey yeah and i do think it's quite interesting that she mentions that the captain was her former partner so knows her very well but really treats her like yeah that. really like, badly he treats her really badly like you know that that idea where she's wearing that t-shirt and he's like we have a dress code here you know are you drunk again kind of thing uh, over and over <laughs> to her just giving out to her even though she, she tends to be someone that does get her criminals she tends to be the person that solves a lot of cases so um she she is out of there understandable that she leaves the gcpd in this movie basically doesn't want, doesn't want to work within that environment anymore right yeah, no, completely, and they don't sugarcoat the reason. Mm-hmm. Like, they, they, it's not subtle as why, or it's based. Yeah, no, they're all a holes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Everybody just treats her really badly in there. Um, let's talk about Cassandra Kane a little bit, Chris. You know a little bit about Cassandra Kane outside of this movie, right? Yes, th- this is a weird one. Um, <laughs> very different I, I'm, in the movies from from comic books, right? Yeah, so Cassandra Kane is one of the Batgirls. Mm. Her father was an assassin, and she was raised by the stepfather to not... She was never taught to speak. She was silent, um, and essentially was only ever taught to fight, um, and went on to become Batgirl, then Black Bat, and then is now in the current DC comic books as Orphan. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a very strange one to have her as this... Street Thief? Yeah. So I don't know where they're going with this. Mm-hmm. It, I, I think potentially... it It's weird. They could have called her anything. So I think there was a probably at a certain point they were going to make her Batgirl or uh, Orphan or something. Mm. Uh, and then they didn't. Or there is a sequel lined up in their heads of where they want to go with this. Yeah, maybe. And maybe. make her... She's Orphan and Harley Quinn. Yeah, yeah. The duo kind of thing. Yeah. Well, that, that specifically is set up in here saying she has no parents and moved around foster family to foster family. You know, there's a little story that they could bring out in future. The other story, her, her creation of the comic book of uh, her going around and being trained by, by assassins sounds very like Helena Bert- Bertinelli's story, doesn't it? So yes. can't imagine you're going to have those two characters having such a similar origin in the movie. You have to kind of pare those things down and make them distinct characters. So having the street uh, urchin, I suppose, who kind of knows uh, Dinah Lance, who lives in the same apartment block as her, having that connection there, and then having her kind of meet up with Harley at her lowest and believe that Harley, what Harley's become is actually amazing. She kind of <laughs> really wants to become like Harley, even though Harley thinks that she's at her lowest ebb right now. Uh, I kind of like that relationship between the two of them where it feels like she's just found her new role model and Harley Quinn's going, I haven't even, I can't even find dinner today. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but at the 37 rules, that's the most important thing. When you get to set rule 37, mm-hmm. I find it so strange they chose the name. It feels to me it was either plan. It's either something that they're building to, or that it was a plan at one point and then just didn't go down that way. Yeah. And um, but it's a she. She is a good urchin. Mm-hmm. The character is really well done. I do love that they they live in um, Anus Constructions. <laughs> I did um, see that. Yeah. <laughs> Anus property. Um. So it should be Janus properties. Um. But yeah, that was fun. That was, there's a few of them littered about and I know there's going to be more of when I get, when I get my hands on this and I'm going to be able to freeze frame a bit. Cause mm-hmm. I saw two, uh, uh, Anus Cosmetics or Janus Cosmetics mm-hmm. from, called from the comic books, uh, and, uh, Janus construction or anus construction. <laughs> well, speaking of anus, of course, she does swallow the diamond. Um, and I do, I really liked how, 
she's gaffer taped effectively to the the <laughs> toilet in, in, in booby trap. Mm-hmm. There's prune juice. Um, I, there's laxatives. There's the great supermarket sweep uh-huh. where they get all the laxatives. I think there's a few other things, and it's still not budging. Yeah. Um, I reckon chuck a fig roll in there, and it would have gone <laughs> no, before you knew No, it's the burrito, it. man. The burrito always does it. I can swear, <laughs> I can speak from personal experience. Anytime I have a problem, it's like, you know what, I'm going to get a burrito with some extra spicy sauce on <laughs> nice. there. Nice. Cigarettes and uh, coffee. Excellent stuff. Cigarettes and coffee, dude. Yes, <laughs> welcome, welcome to Movies on TV Podcast. <laughs> exactly. Where yes. we will sort out your... Your Gosh, irritable bowel syndrome, <laughs> um, for sure. But aren't, yeah, aren't I reckon... you glad that we only do four or five of these movies a year? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, High fiber, indeed. But it didn't seem to be working. Absolutely. But um, I do like the threat to begin with from uh, from Harley <laughs> Quinn when they go into the supermarket. It's like it's either the prune juice or I get that knife over there and it's coming out of you through your stomach. <laughs> Basically, okay, I'll take the prune juice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I did like it when she enters into Harley Quinn's apartment as well. Uh, she just goes, this apartment is dope. She's kind of really in on it. And, of course, it's where we're introduced to to Bruce, the hyena, mm-hmm. oh. which is really, really good as Named well. Named after Bruce Wayne. Yeah. Yes. The hunky billionaire. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was That was really cool. I must say I was really kind of, oh, my goodness, Bruce isn't dead, is he, uh, when the apartment's attacked by Sionis's guys. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, the ni- nicely done and... Sort of, I think, again, on the trail, Margot Robbie was saying that, I think it was on Graham Norton where she did kind of joke with, with Graham Norton saying, oh, yeah, no, we had a trained hyena. And he was like, really? And she goes, no, 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 way too dangerous, way too unpredictable. <laughs> Apparently there is one, but even then it's like... Nobody move! Yeah, there's there's kind of one that's fit for sort of being on films. Mm. Um, and they went to see it and it was like, no, 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 definitely not. So it was an actual dog then with the cgi of the hyena over it so yeah. the whole uh red licorice was and you know going to lady and the tramp it was with uh some hound underneath it so but i, I thought bruce was good I, I like the whole sort of joke that he he's after bruce wayne as well it's cool i i did think they were gonna kill bruce off just so that they could bring in uh bud and lou which are the two hyenas she had from the which started, I believe, in the the, the animated show, mm. and then moved. To, they moved into the comic books. Yeah, I did think they were going to do that, and then have her and getting two new hyenas. Um, but yeah, it was still good. He's way too cute. He's way too cute to to yeah. die in the first movie. He just has to get a buddy next time. That's all. <laughs> and they, they call it Dick. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, after the orphan that looks after that lives with Bruce. Yeah, that's exactly what it could be. Yeah, uh, I I love that intro as well, where she where she goes and picks out Bruce the first time, and you see the guy coming on to her and saying, you know, well, I don't have to accept money; I get payment in kind. And then the next time you see Bruce, he's eating the guy's leg. Yeah, <laughs> that was like a <laughs> great moment uh, for Harley Quinn just to just to show it. nobody can get one over at her. That's really good fun. Can Can we just also speak about the beaver? Oh yes. It's just like it's again just the little things mm-hmm. these little touches that is just like the, it's it's funny to have a beaver it's even funnier to have a beaver <laughs> with goggly eyes with his paws out like it's about to grab you and it's and funnier just, again to have a beaver stuffed with his paw out with the goggly eyes in a little pink ballet dress <laughs> <laughs> and even funnier because she talks to him like he's alive as well uh, yeah, yeah that, that's really good fun <laughs> uh, we've already talked a little bit already about about helena uh, bertinelli who is huntress uh who is also the crossbow killer um i like how they weaved her story in throughout the movie uh, even if you didn't know it was her from the beginning i liked how she is very central to what's going on but nobody has pieced it together you know it feels like you're almost on the detective trail with Rene Montoya from the beginning you know who's this character why is she involved oh it's that flashback to 15 years ago when her family were killed and that's how she moved on you only get that towards the end of the movie uh, but yeah I already mentioned the, the touch of her going do you know who I am and then killing them before they even have a chance to recognize <laughs> who she is and she's got her whole speech and her origin story prepared and nobody gets to hear it except for the rest of the birds of prey at the end of the film which I thought was a, a great great touch for the character i i just i loved mary elizabeth winsett mm-hmm. like it's she, she's now one of my new crushes because i was just <laughs> like she was so good so the comedic timing was perfect the seriousness was perfect um just yeah i it was 
fantastic. I, 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 I loved her in 10 Cloverfield Lane. Mm-hmm. She's one of your new cr- crushes after Scott Pilgrim. You you wouldn't you don't still hold a candle for her right back from her, her time as Ramona. I do, honestly, I do. But like, <laughs> also, she didn't. She she's one of these actresses that kind of comes in and out uh, of kind of pop culture zeitgeist. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so for me, it was big big fan of Ramona. And then nothing, because she kind of disappeared. She didn't disappear. She just didn't take the, the, the kind of more uh, box office films. I, I think it's a sign for for an actress like her. I think it's a sign when you think about four movies that she's done. All have been fantastic. You've mentioned them all there. Um, I feel like she just waits for a part. And there's not many of these kind of parts that she really enjoys doing. So uh, when she comes out and, and has her name up and lights above a great movie, she'll absolutely stand over it. And I think you can really. Uh, all four of those movies you've mentioned, Chris, are all really, really good uh, Hollywood films. So uh, Yeah, so and she was in the Gemini Man. Mm-hmm. Not a great Hollywood film, but she was great in it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, but in this film, she was brilliant. Mm-hmm. It, it, again, I, I, I'm not going to blow smoke up her, um, her crossbow, but it was a great character, well written. Um, they did the flashback well. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a bit of a predictable reveal to a degree. I kind of assumed it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't. Yeah. But like, it was meant to be. Yeah, exactly. Now, that being said, I asked my wife when we, after seeing the film, because again, for any of our listeners, she's not a comic book fan. I, I'm the nerd that drags her along to this stuff. He keeps saying uh, this, but uh, 400 episodes on, and she's seen every single thing that we've covered. So uh, I, I don't know, know, man. She's starting <laughs> to become that. And she but, did uh, marry you during that time as well, so you're not pushing her away either. So not bad. Yeah, I think there's a bit of nerd in Kelly, to be uh-huh. honest. But uh, she didn't know that about Huntress and kind of the, the, the backstory. Mm. So it was interesting. She didn't fully see it coming. Yeah. So I again a slight burden of knowledge for all of our fans who may know the the Huntress character and kind of the the backstory, but at the same time it was good. <laughs> I was happy with it, um, and yeah, it was just and the the the, the fight scenes. Oh, but we'll get to that later. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing is, as well, like you know, her story is is the one that's driving as well. Uh, Black Mask here, exactly, um, yeah. so. And also just driving, you know, his sort of need to expand his empire in Gotham as well and, and take out his rivals. So, um, you know, again, as you say, how it's interwoven into the movie is just really nicely done. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was really good. I think as well with Black Canary, the, the fourth member of the Birds of Prey that come together in Booby Trap, um, you know, Dinah Lance, uh, who's the, the fourth, uh, member of the Birds of Prey. Mm. I have a really soft spot for Black Canary. Um, it comes from Green Arrow. Oh, I know it wasn't played by the same actress, but, uh, Laurel, uh, will be with me, uh, always. Uh, I do like the fact that we see her sort of, you know, give those lungs a good workout, oh, yeah. uh, as they're surrounded by Sionis's henchmen, uh, as, as they've run out of bullets. She really decides to open up those vocal cords, which is really good. And as you say, um, in the club, really, really nice voice. Uh, so I, I like that whole thing of her being a singer um, and then, you know, having to, to rein it down uh, in terms of the, the pitch that she gets. Uh, but I do like where she kind of just strays over and it cracks uh, the cocktail glass of, of Sionis. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another character that's really well woven into the story as well, I thought. Um, I, I like that she's the one that goes to save Harley Quinn, who's been who's way too drunk and some guys are trying to bundle her in the back of a van. She's the one that kicks ass and takes them all out. Yeah. And it's because of that that Cyanus goes, actually, you'd be a really good driver for me. You can protect me when, uh, when Zaz isn't around, basically. I uh, kind of like that little touch that... It's also Harley Quinn's fault. She also lives in the same apartment as uh, as Cassandra Cain, uh, has got a, a relationship with her. So it's not like, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna criticize Suicide Squad. We've already talked about it on another podcast, but it's done so well here to bring all of these characters together and make a reason why they would all be in the same room together. There are connections between each of them, unlike Suicide Squad, where it was like, eh, we'll just stick all these villains together and they'll go out and do a mission for the government, which did feel a little bit like i don't really know why that guy's over there and why considering all of these people are villains 
somebody just doesn't kill the guy that's annoying them because that's what most likely they would do. <laughs> Whereas in this, it really does feel like everybody has a reason to be there and they exactly. all kind of know each other and they all kind of trust each other a little bit. If, they, if they're in a spot, they're all going to work together and it makes a lot of sense by the end of the film, uh, particularly with Dana Lance and with uh, Helena Bersinelli because they have those kind of relationships and connections throughout the movie, really. Well, they do try and kill each other in the third act, but yeah. that's just... But it's, it's just how friends greet each other. I regularly throw John out, out of a window. Mm-hmm. He's been practicing for his uh, for yeah. his fall out of window. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I can do a triple salco now and land on my feet. <laughs> I am like a kitty cat. Excellent. <laughs> uh, I do also like that it, that kind of moment where uh, Harley Quinn sees Dinah Lance and goes, you're that singer that no one listens to. And Dinah's response of, oh, you're the a-hole everybody hates, right? <laughs> Just like yeah. that kind of interplay between the two. Because then you get the Montoya chase afterwards where all these kind of grievances are, mm-hmm. are being played out. It is, again, just... Coming back to what you you just said around Suicide Squad, it's about the difference of the structure and the writing yeah. of of the piece, both how it's structured on the screenplay, but also then how the director has taken that and, and woven yeah. it through. And it is just really, really good. It's character and story over spectacle at, at a lot of times, because I do think there's a little touch there as well from Harley when, when she's told from Dana, you're the a-hole that everybody hates. There is that moment that you can see in Harley Quinn's face where she's going, does everybody hate me? Why would everybody hate me? And then yeah. and then she goes through all the people that want to kill her and goes, <laughs> oh, that's probably why. Yeah. <laughs> and that guy, and the, oh, I don't even remember why they might. And that guy that reasons. I tattooed the Joker's mask on his face <laughs> yeah, exactly. for no reason other than for a bit of fun. Oh, maybe I can understand why he didn't like me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, question to the audience, or to you, I should say. Are any of these characters going to be in James Gunn's Suic- The Suicide Squad? Which is the, the, the upcoming reboot, remake, we don't know what. The upcoming uh, DC film by James Gunn on The Suicide Squad. I'm just like, is Harley Quinn going to be in it? Is potentially Huntress or... Like, are there any of them, has that been confirmed or discussed at all? Is, is there rumors? Uh, not that I'm aware of. There's a rumor that there is a, a three-part Harley Quinn trilogy. This being the first part, there is another one which will be the Birds of Prey on their own. And there's another one where she's setting up her own villainous gang. Um, so that'll be the second film. And the final film will be the two going up against each other. Uh, that's the rumor of the three kind of trilogy structure, if they were to do a trilogy. But I think they've been very focused because of how long it's taken to get this movie made and get the budget together and get the production together. They've been very clear about kind of going, um, we're doing this movie. Let's see how how much everybody likes it, it kind of thing. Um, they're, they're, again, it's not like the... MCU where they they go we're doing 10 films in a row for the next five years and um, we're they're, they're very much kind of going we know we've been burnt before by throwing out we've got these 20 movies in the pipe in the pipeline uh, so they're they're releasing them and seeing how people like them and I hope people well, do like you mean this. I'm not gonna see the cyborg you never know you never know <laughs> that's kind of the thing with DC you never know what's, what's Green Lantern next. could pop up yeah shock horror Green Lantern is coming to TV very soon so uh yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll see they have they have Is that of a case of be prepared for disappointment? Who knows? Who knows? I'm hoping not. Yeah, I'm hoping oh, not as well. Oh, but... oh a preserver. Um but they were the protagonists mm-hmm. and but let's move on and speak spectacularly about maybe these antagonists mm-hmm. that we have as well. Um I know you guys were more of a fan of the Gotham Zaz, mm-hmm. um but we do get a very victorious Zaz in my eyes okay. um in my, in my head it was a it was a different take you you have a very different take on Zaz oh it's a different uh, take definitely I just probably preferred Anthony Carrigan's version of him my big question for these two characters for Black Mask and Victor Zaz the two antagonists to this movie they're in a relationship right they're together no like there are moments when you have Victor coming up to uh Sionis rubbing his face and going don't worry I'll take care of it and all you're missing is, I'll take care of it, honey, at the end. Yeah, you know? exactly. There really are these moments where I was wondering, are the two of them in a relationship? Because it doesn't feel like Sionis wants anything to do with any of the women that are in the club at all. Um, he feels quite arrogant and distant from all of them. Even Dinah Lance, he kind of wants her around to just sing songs for him. But with Victor, Victor keeps goading him over and over again into making awful decisions as well. Just wondering, are they in some kind of relationship? What do you think, John? 
I got that as well. There were kind of moments where you almost feel as though Victor is breathing in Black Mask and mm. uh, Roman Sionis in, in this. As you say, the, the touches, the closeness of how he talks to him. It, it did feel like there was something there. Not to say that there was, but it, there was definitely a hint that they were were or had been in some kind of relationship to me uh for sure and mm-hmm. um, whether they were in the mind of the screenwriter who knows but the way it was played were was quite sensual i think between the two mm-hmm. uh, i never thought i'd say that about black mask and victor Saz before uh before now but yeah it was very sensual i i personally didn't get the rel- the let me say this. i personally didn't get the relationship mm-hmm. I got that Zaz was in love with Sionis. Mm-hmm. Um, I took more that Sionis was more bisexual and liked both Victor and, in this case, uh, the Canary. Right. Um, his little songbird. Yeah. Or what I took from it was Zaz was... Uh, yeah, well, Zaz says he loves him yeah. in, in the end. Um, but I also got that... Uh, kind of Ewan McGregor's take on the Black Mask is that he didn't get his hands dirty himself mm-hmm. until the end. He he got some kind of release from watching Victor mm-hmm. do his thing. Exactly. Um, uh, so it was very symbiotic. And that's when you got that kind of face-stroking yeah. moment and I love, let me kill her, let me take her, mo- or her face. Um, but then he was like, no, don't touch my little songbird. Mm-hmm. I think maybe symbiotics a really good uh, description, actually, of their relationship. Yes. Um, rather than maybe that they were in a in a relationship because it, it was it's like they fed off one another. Yet, I I also kind of like the fact that when Victor effectively messed up, he he was hiding that from uh, Sionis mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was definitely. It was just I, th- I don't think it was the traditional quote unquote relationship. Like a like a a boyfriend boyfriend. I think it was like that kind. It was it was a weird relationship. I, I think it was a nice different take though on the bad guys and yes. the bad guy and his henchmen. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think it was an, a different take and a really interesting choice um, compared to you know probably ninety percent of other comic related movies. Yeah. Um, it, it it felt complicated. It, it it felt, as you say, symbiotic. It, it felt sensual. It was it was a different take. Mm-hmm. There was there was almost an uneasiness about the the bad guys because you couldn't quite place them. Yeah. Um. In in a sense. Well, there's also that thing of you know, Victor Zaz is a villain in his own right and has gone through and done plots and plans himself. So. Why would he be subservient to Black Mask? You know, um, that that is kind of the question that you have to answer for comic book fans. Why would you have these two people working together? One being the henchman and one uh, and one being his boss. Why why does that matter? And why why is it that way? Um, I do like that. Effectively, Victor keeps pushing Black Mask to give him more victims. Effectively, that seems to be mm. his plan. Is kind of keep pushing him over the edge because I have a spot right here and I want to kill her. Maybe if I push him in that direction, he'll make sure that I go out and, and get the opportunity to kill Dino Lance. You know, maybe there's a little bit of that as well. So uh, so I kind of like how they how they built up their relationship. Uh, one of the things that you, that you just kind of hit on there for me as well, John, this is a very different villain uh, throughout this movie. You know, the, the portrayal of Ewan McGregor, I've seen loads of reviews who are there going, oh, he doesn't quite chew the scenery enough for me. As if that's exactly the way you have to play this villain is that he has to chew the scenery. He has to be somebody that's in there having a laugh riot all the time. And he's the one that you can't take your eyes off because he's the villain of the movie. You don't necessarily have to do that because you saw it in the other 40 movies that you've that you've watched that are that have villains like this in it. Um, I think they're going for a very different version of the character. I think you're, they're going for someone who is genuinely scary to people around him. You know, the per, the person that's most scary is come into my house for a party. Oh, you did something that I consider wrong. Now I'm going to kill you. You know, he's genuinely that scary. Yeah. You know, that moment with Erica at, at, beside the bar where he tells her to stand up on the table and dance for him and then take off her dress, embarrassing her in front of everybody else. They do a great job where they catch all of the women in the club 
and the reaction on their faces to what Erica is going through and being put through by this person who has complete control of the room because he owns it. And they yeah. know if they don't do what he says, they're dead and their faces could be slit, slit off, you know? Um, I, I like that take on the character. He's not supposed to be a Jack Nicholson joker, haha, am I hilarious? He's not supposed to be like that. He does feel like he's supposed to be dangerous. Yeah. Um, and I think they did a good job of building him up that way. And, and that's it. He is socially dangerous because he's powerful. And, and like with Erica, it's she she was laughing at something completely unrelated, mm-hmm. but he thought it was a mocking laugh um, at him and, and the fact that, you know, at this moment in time, he was failing to get the diamond. And of course, absolutely nothing to do with it, but it's that danger. Dare I say it, a slightly kind of weird tack, but it, it's like the Aaron Hernandez uh, documentary on Netflix where you suddenly realize that, you know, two guys going about their business spills a drink on him mm. um one of them by just purely by accident and he took that personally and ultimately uh drove by and shot them allegedly and and so it's it, it's that scariness of something that you do like that is absolutely mm-hmm. um just during the normal course of a conversation or an accident or something like that, and someone goes crazy on it. Yeah. So um, I really kind of uh, enjoyed that. It, it felt like a simmering anger. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really good from Ewan McGregor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, overall, it just felt different from most of the other villains that we've seen. Remember, DC have a movie which is based around only villains, right? So, so they've done a lot of villains in their movies. Uh, I thought he just felt very different. Not the best thing in the movie uh, by any means, but a, a worthy adversary for for the uh, the other rest of the cast that are in here. And that that's one of the things I completely agree with you. And that's one of the things that shocks me mm-hmm. is that at the end of this film, Black Mask is dead. Yeah, there's no no coming back from for him. <laughs> yeah, unless you he can is, piece him back he together. Is, he somehow. is sushi. <laughs> yeah, he is chunky. I really liked that whole scene on the pier with the statues. Um, I thought that was so nicely done. Mm -hmm. It it was great. Yeah. Yeah. I like, and it was what a way to kill him. I was not expecting that. I wasn't expecting him to die. Yes. One thing I will say is I do not think Zaz is dead. Zaz as a character is not, he got shot crossbowed in the neck, but we never see him officially fully bite the bullet. Oh, okay. So I do think that they kind of kept him so that he can go a bit more crazy and either he can be uh, don the black mask, mm-hmm. which would be interesting, um, or uh, he goes full Zaz, skinhead, multiple cuts, right. uh, and is a bit more crazy because Harley Quinn, you killed the love of my life. Right. Maybe, maybe. The person who allowed me to kill. Yeah. Now I'm untethered. I think that would partially um, kind of ruin Huntress's story, though. Like, I absolutely love that moment when the bolt comes out of nowhere and kills Zaz. And then a couple of minutes later, while everybody's fighting about whether they should join up, you've got Huntress kind of going, I've accomplished my mission. Now, can I just leave and not have this conversation with you guys? I've killed everybody <laughs> yeah. that was involved. Zaz was one of the people that killed her family. Uh, and he's the last person on her list. So she's finally accomplished her list. And now she's going to walk away. I, I really did like that as as her story. It's something that you don't realize until it's all put together that that's who she's been going after. All of these people that killed her family effectively. Yeah, and I, I liked as well... Um just coming back to Zaz, I, I I did like the fact that they showed the scars mm. and that it was nice and extensive, um, and I liked the all the masks in Roman Sionis's sort of home, mm. uh, and certainly with the shrunken heads as he's kind of saying how delicious it is um, that they they they've gotten these shrunken heads yeah. and how they're created. So <laughs> it was kind of nice. It was kind of a nice creepy touch. Yeah. To be honest, well, I was again like eight hundred years old. And yeah, it's just hanging on my wall. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. pickled, yeah. pickled. Have you ever been to the Deep Congo? Mm-hmm. Oh no, no worries. Just, <laughs> I have. To kind of round out. I'm a huge fan of both of them as antagonists. Mm-hmm. I just think Sinus is a gone. I see what you mean about th- if Zaz is alive, it invalidates the Huntress's piece. Mm-hmm. But also, that's a perfect excuse for them to come back to Gotham and 
have to grab Harley again or something, something, something. Yeah. As we know, Bridget. nobody ever is really dead in comic books. Exactly. Apart from well, Black well, Mask. no, no, no. Black <laughs> Mask is he's a hundred percent absolutely. Um, we would be remiss if we didn't go on to our next point because the fight sequences in this movie is basically our next point, right? Um, and I think it was really important to get this right. The choreographer for this movie was John Valera and the uh, stunt coordinator was Jonathan Osebio. Uh, they worked together on the John Wick movies. Uh, I think John, uh, Jonathan Osebio was uh, on John Wick 1 and 2 and then uh, John Valera joined them on on, uh, on 3. Um, both of them worked together on Deadpool 2, Creed 2, some of the Marvel movies, Doctor yeah. Strange, Black Panther, Thor Ragnarok. They've done so many fight sequences over time and you can tell in this movie they're going for a different level of fight sequence planning all of this stuff together uh, there's many big moments in the movie uh, you've already mentioned one earlier on john the police prince precinct battle with the exploding uh glitter bombs uh, which was absolutely great really enjoyed that that's uh, that kind of sequence as she's making her way through level by level as if it's a video game uh, probably is inside harley quinn's mind uh, all the way through this uh, this place not killing anybody but taking everybody out with these glitter bombs well and dare i say it as well uh, uh, speaking of broken legs, we do have the crowbar to the shins as well mm. in the police lockup right at the end of that whole sequence that goes from, you know, the the GCPD precinct into the cells where you have that great fight with the water mm -hmm. um, as, as the, the look on Harley Quinn's face as she's trying to figure out how to open the cells. And then when she's in there, they all just open and everyone yeah. has grievances uh, against Harley Quinn. But then in the lockup, um, I again, another wince moment. Mm -hmm. um, stuff to the legs is not in my kind of thing, really. No. I did l let out a pretty big scream in the cinema at one point, and <laughs> I, I think it was around um, the her jumping on 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 the on the shins of the driver in the club mm -hmm. that was only like three minutes into yeah the film, it was so. <laughs> and i was like "Ooh, that was loud yeah yeah um speaking of the gcpd lockup the that evidence locker um I, I know every single fan is going as soon as this comes out on blu-ray or potentially before is going to be um freeze framing Looking for Mr. Freeze's like blaster in the background right. or like her original mallet or like just little Easter eggs. I couldn't see any. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that, that they'll do, they'll be there. It was one of those ones that I, you know, and, and I think I said this in kind of my notes. I've written it as I'm genuinely surprised how few there were because you've got a massive room full of stuff. Um, I could not pick out any. I was very, I was combing through uh, the, this scene the second time I saw it as well, trying to pick out things that were, uh, that could have been connected to previous movies, that kind of stuff. And I couldn't see them. I'm sure there's, uh, there's much bigger fans out there of DC stuff. And I just wonder whether it's that thing, as we we're talking about earlier on, Chris, that they're not specifically planning for a sequel right now because they want to make sure that they get this movie 100% right. Um, there are definitely things within this. I know uh, already I've heard people uh, who are fans of Harley Quinn comic books and Harley Quinn, uh, the cartoon and that kind of stuff, who've already talked about things that they've seen in the movie that I wouldn't have seen because I haven't read much for comics or much of the, or seen much of the cartoons. Um, but weirdly, the police lockup, I think it's probably another thing that hangs over from uh, from the time we watch uh, the MCU movies where every corner of every screen has something in there that's a, a massive Easter egg, and I just don't see them in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> the only one I thought, and maybe it's a little generic, was the bowling ball. Because I remember seeing Harley Quinn, car you know, she's got her mallet, mm -hmm. the two hyenas. But I also remember her using a bowling ball. I, I don't know yeah. enough of the comics to be able to say that. Yeah. But there's something in my mind where she's she's used a bowling ball. Right. I suppose everyone's weapon of choice at the end of the day. <laughs> but uh yeah, I, I I thought that was the only thing and but that's so generic, it's nothing particularly standout mm. like the mallet, you know. And I know she has she has her other weapon of choice in this movie, another piece of sporting equipment. We get her baseball bat uh, in here, unpainted. 
Uh, mm-hmm. This time it's a regular baseball bat, but she uses it to great effect in that fight just after she gets oh. all coked up to the eyeballs. <laughs> oh, yeah, that Which, was... Wasn't that brilliant? Yeah. Wasn't that just a really clever use? So good. It's just like, she's going to hide behind something. Okay, let's make it a mounted coke. That explains why she's <laughs> was really able good. to take on these big birdie men. Uh-huh. Hilarious. Um, oh, and just that final bit is two, two points on just the seat before we move on to some, the, the, the other big scene, fight scenes. Um, was that the bounce of the, the, uh, baseball bat when she throws it at the ground mm-hmm. it knocks in the guy's face and flies back to her and she grabs it cgi to hell i know but it was just so well yeah, done that was cool as anything it was mm-hmm. and then when montoya grabs her at the end she's handing her phone and rather than just normally knocking out um the 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 kind of cop she backflip kicks mm-hmm. the phone and montoya's head knocks her out yeah Again, just showing that gymnastic kind of more Harley Quinn fight, fight style, uh-huh. uh, which is just really well done. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think they just had so many ideas that they could put in here that the fight with uh, Donna Lance and the kidnappers, I thought was really uh, competent looking. It looked like she had some proper fight training in there. Uh, really good to watch on screen. Um, and then we come to, I think, probably my favorite scene in the film not just fight scene in the film um i'm calling it a batman 66 inspired fight uh the final battle at the booby trap uh it really felt like something out of adam west's batman and that works so well with this character of harley quinn um the the fight with the hands where they're all yeah. slapping slapping the bad guys with the hands they're all getting together in a circle and trying to protect cassandra from being from being taken and each of them are taking on five or ten of sionis's guys uh, in their own in individually choreographed battle i just thought it was so well put together each in their own choreographed battle that we also get to see in the background Mm -hmm. while we're focused on the others so i just i i I thought it was fantastic that we like the camera panned i don't know how many shots that must have taken Mm -hmm. but we focused in on uh harley quinn and she was doing her that was sorry another Easter egg from the comic books. Harley Quinn roller derby. Yes, yes. That that comes from the comic books. That's a big part. And seeing her fight in this last part of the film in roller skates is just spectacular. How did Great she have com- time for a shoot change? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> which Great. I thought was hilarious. Yeah, yeah. that was brilliant. Uh, it's kind of like, oh, who cares? Just enjoy the fight. Because <laughs> like you, that, if they hadn't called it out. Someone else would yeah, at one point. It was, and they just like, yeah, we're gonna call it out. We're just like everyone else going, but did you change your shoes? Oh, it's just so um, good, yeah. and that's why you know that that they know this character so well, mm-hmm. and and what they're doing because it's just calling out that little thing that you know the continuity. I, it's so good. It's so yeah. self aware. I absolutely yeah. loved it. I loved um, the other thing I loved as well was where. After Sionis's, um sort of guys and henchmen come through the window and they're shooting them, they escape down the, the slide, the amusement slide. Uh-huh. And I love that Huntress effectively kills one of them and then uses him as that slide board to go down. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool that as well. Very cool, very cool. I love. I also love the floor made out of uh, made out of trampolines as well, so that everybody's <laughs> getting into their battle in the air as well. Hilarious. Uh, one call out is the hairband land moment. Mm-hmm. Um, just was brilliant. Where literally Harley gives uh Canary. So like, do, do you need a hairband? Yeah, because oh, oh here you go. I'll never go into battle without one. <laughs> um, I I literally have seen many ladies call this a moment out as being oh my god yeah that's so true it's a brilliant moment <laughs> and i'm just like i just thought it was bloody brilliant because again yeah if you're you're kicking that much ass yeah you don't want your dreadlocks kind of getting in the way <laughs> um because that's his like, you make the joke about why people uh it's in the incredibles you don't wear a cape yeah because it gets caught in thing and mm-hmm. people can grab it it's the same thing. And it was much more long. seriously put in Watchmen, right? So Yes, exactly. <laughs> it did lead to the death of a character in there. Um, yeah, but overall, the fight sequences, I think, was our was our fourth point. Uh, anything else jumping out about the fight sequences or bouncing around about the fight sequences? They're guys? just really nicely done, and you mm-hmm. just immerse yourself in them because it, it's fun, it's up-tempo, and, yeah, really good. Mm-hmm. For me, it was just very quickly the 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 end scene 
where we have Hardy on the her roller skates going after Blas- Black Mask um, in his car, and we get that whipping moment. We get her being accelerated by Canary, um, and it was just, it, yes, it were, you can see the John Wick in mm-hmm. it because that's literally parts of John Wick Three right. where you have the motorbike chasing, um, but it was again played to really good effect. Mm-hmm. Because she was whipping to the side, jumping to the side, jumping on top of it. I just thought that was a really nice, it was really well done fight. Back. Absolutely. I was so surprised. I don't know why, because she was on roller skates, but I was so surprised when we when we saw Black Canaries. Her scream is amazing. Like, it's so much more powerful than what we've seen in the TV show version yeah. of the character, where she's sending people up in the air and they're almost stopping in midair because of the power. But I must admit, I was really surprised seeing Harley fly out of there on her roller skates i shouldn't have been surprised she was on roller skates of course she was going to use it as her projectile out there to take down down sionis but uh it just made me laugh i thought it was really really good uh, use of the character's power if you're only going to use it once in the film and you see her dropping to the ground because of the power that she's used if you're going to going to use it once in the film what a great way to use it yeah but it also does introduce uh, the metahumans into this part of it as well we know they had been in because of diablo and suicide squad right but uh, it, they have introduced because it's it's the super it's the you don't have too many super powered mm-hmm. people in the you, well you have none but it, it introduced that the powers are there yeah exactly very very cool let's wrap up our discussion about uh, about birds of prey just with the final moments really of the movie the birds of prey are formed um what did you think about how this all wrapped up as a film with them all getting together. And we have uh, Rena Montoya not actually going back to the police service. She was never going to anyway. Um, she's she's done with that stuff. Uh, we got Black Canary and we got Huntress, who has now finished her mission. But everybody thinks she's cool here. And they're all starting to call her Huntress. So maybe she has a place to stay uh, with these other characters. Black Canary's lost her job as driver and singer in Cyanus's club. So uh, she's at a loose end. So why not have these three get together and kick some more ass in Gotham City? Well, they, they have the Burton Alley fortune. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I loved it. I liked it. it. Was a it was a nice, it was a nice ending. Um, are they strong enough as a team to own their own film? Personally, I don't know. Uh, I think having the offset that is Harley Quinn mm-hmm. in that that craziness element is needed. I personally just think that that's my own thing. I like that they they. Hardy calls them the do good or yeah, dorks. Me too. Because it is they they are like we're gonna clean this clean up this town in from the inside out. Mm-hmm. Um so they are doing that. And I think the the Birds of Prey 2, if we're gonna call it that, would need to still have Hardy Quinn in it as the anti hero. Oh maybe, maybe. That being said, I love the characters mm-hmm. because they're fleshed out to a degree and fantastically acted. It's just the the strength of this, it's this. It would depend on the script. That's Absolutely, probably the best yeah, thing yeah. Always does, Chris. Always does. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Was anybody surprised by Harley Quinn uh, hopping in the car with Cassandra and driving off on their own new adventure with uh, lots and lots of cash? No, that's exactly what I was expecting <laughs> yeah. from the, the sequel. <laughs> yeah. I literally was going, okay. I actually thought all of them would go off together. Oh, okay. Yeah, me too. And like it would be the 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 like you'd have some funny Thelma and Louise. Actually, I did think they were going to finish on Greece. Like a bit of a musical where they kind of drove into the air. Right. Because <laughs> they had the Cadillac and stuff. Right. I just assumed that was where we were going to get. Um, no, but I did expect it was going to be her kind of, uh, but they are the, the do gooder dorks. And then you see her kind of come into the fight as well, going, what? No one ever said I was a bad person. Right. Something along that, like where she is with them and they've discovered that through the power of friendship, they, they can take on everyone i'm really happy it didn't go that way i'm really happy that we have harley quinn pretty much back to a better version of herself from the beginning of the film i like that she says that to cassandra um that the reason she keeps her around is because you make me want to be a better person a slightly better person yeah (laughs) yeah it's a slightly better person isn't it is the is the way she delivers the line so it is her basically saying i'm not going to give up being evil and robbing banks and taking stuff but I, I don't want to kill you. I suppose that makes me slightly better, right? <laughs> and as she munches into her perfect egg, egg sandwich exactly, as well. Exactly. Uh, Armenian hair, you got to love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and six-month-old cheese, of course. Uh, guys, do you want to get into any Easter eggs that we may not have mentioned uh, in in this? 
Yeah, I've got one very quick one, which was uh, that in the scene where Renee Montoya and uh, she's getting drunk in the background on her TV, mm-hmm. there is the um, a video of Arlene Sorkin, who was the original uh, voice for Harley Quinn in the Batman animated sh- sh- uh, show. She also did. She basically was Harley Quinn all the way up to. Oh, God, when? Um, I think it was kind of uh, the Batman, the Arkham City games. Oh, right, right. Um, so she, like, Arlene Sorkin was all the way up through the original um, the original Batman games, the the uh, Batman Beyond. She, wa- she is the iconic voice. Yes. She was replaced by Tara Strong later on. Mm-hmm. Um, but she's, re- and she did, so basically in, there's this sketch where she was Harley Quinn dressed up as a kind of a different version of it. Right. Um, so they had that playing in the background. Um, and I thought it was that. I, I literally started Googling around on it and there's an interview. I don't know where, what was it for? It was an interview where they've interviewed, um, uh, Margot Robbie mm-hmm. and she didn't know about this. Right. She never spotted this. She didn't know that's what it was. And it wasn't until like they're, they're just as some of their final editing and that she saw that it was there and asked about it and they said it and she was like, this is a brilliant. A great idea. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Give a bit of respect back to the character because I, I, I suppose maybe some people don't know that the character of Harley Quinn was created for the Batman animated series. Uh, she wasn't a character in the comic book. She was a character created for the TV show for the cartoon and then moved into comic books later, a couple of years after uh, she was created on the show. So you, you see her created by Bruce Tim, who was the person that did Batman, the animated series. So, uh, so the original character came part and parcel with that voice and with that action movements, I suppose. So, uh, so yeah. nice to give some credit there. Um, the movie does also give some credit to the new animated series. Um, I don't know whether anybody stuck around for the final post credit line, uh, not a scene. <laughs> it is one line, and it's cut off on purpose uh, because effectively it's Harley Quinn saying, "Well, I have to give you something since you sat around so long. Don't tell anybody, but Batman f- bats," which is a reference to her constant accusation in the new cartoon. <laughs> That's why yeah. he's called Batman. Uh, hilarious little moment, but I'm not sure whether you people should have hung around for uh, for three or four minutes for that final line. <laughs> it's not very long. The credits aren't actually very long in this in this movie. They're, they they do go by quite quickly, but uh, but just a fun little line at the end. I, I I stuck around. I enjoyed it. It's so funny that we've been trained into staying for post credits mm-hmm. just on the off chance that we get it. Like it's just never before. Like it's just so weird to think of. Everyone used to always get up, and now literally the theater was full. Yeah, everyone was like, "Oh, they're gonna have something." Oh, um. But the re- like the reason is, you know, my when my parents were kids when we were kids watching movies. Some movies that we would have watched had all those credits at the beginning of the movie before you got to see anything. It was like two minutes of credits of all the people that were involved in the filming, and then the movie started. And then they started moving to the back end of the film. So credits at the beginning were only who's starring and who's directing. And then you started this thing of a pre-credit sequence and then a credit thing, which was James Bond stuff. And then you'd have these massive credits of all the stunts people and all the CGI people. And because you have these massive movies like the Marvel movies and like these movies in DC where you have massive teams working on CGI, credits can go on four or five minutes. So the idea that they came up with was to kind of go, well, all these people deserve a little bit of respect for the work that they did. So maybe we'll put in a little post credit scene for them to watch while they're going through all these people that they, they don't know, but their family's going to really enjoy seeing their name up on the screen, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I do find it really interesting that uh, when did when did when you started watching films did they switch to color? There? <laughs> I know I'm old. I know I'm turning back to black and white in my hair anyway. Um, nice. but, hey. <laughs> uh, John, any other ones that you noticed? Yeah, just the wanted poster that was there uh, for Captain Boomerang, uh, who of course was in Suicide Squad and played by Jai Courtney. Mm-hmm. So just a little reference there. Hey, I know that guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice little touch. Was like, brilliant. can we go and get Will Smith's face or can we go and get somebody <laughs> yeah. else's face? Exactly. Uh, no, let's get Jack Courtney. Yeah, it was weird because he is he is returning. He's confirmed to be returning for the James Gunn mm-hmm. Suicide Squad. So I was like, oh, 
Okay. So there you go. You wanted your connective tissue to the next movie coming up. But there you go, Chris. That was uh, that was it. Yeah, Just that, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, guys, I know we've talked quite a long time about this movie. Overall, what are your final thoughts on Birds of Prey and the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn? I don't have to say that anymore. I could just say Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey, couldn't I? You oh, can. Well. Yeah, you could. John, do you want to go first on this? Yeah, loved uh, this movie. I give it four stray Armenian arm hairs in the perfect egg sandwich out of five and <laughs> um, all washed down with liters and liters of prune juice just to get it passed through the system <laughs> afterwards there's a neat trick or a burrito maybe mm-hmm. um so yeah um i really enjoyed this just really good fun really snappy nicely written brilliantly acted um and directed i i mean there's just it's one of those movies that you could just sit back and relax it was fun um and i really want to see it again yeah and i think i'm I'm not a big harley quinn fan Uh, i love the character yes because she's part of the batman universe but uh, at the same time it's not someone who i've ever really gone out my way to uh sort of read about or whatever and i do think that margot robbie really embodies her uh so so well the sense of humor was dark it was violent, which is exactly what you want from a psychopathic former psychiatric nurse who's been in the presence of the clown prince um, of Gotham for however long. Um, and I love the fact that that is the the rug that has been pulled from underneath her to allow this this the this attack on her from all sorts of people from the the guy with the joker face tattooed on onto uh his own face uh-huh. uh through to roman sionis um and i i really enjoyed that through to bruce the hyena through to the stuffed beaver uh all the way to effectively toilet humor about trying to pass a diamond through uh this this kid's digestive system mm-hmm. with every trick available to it Get the colander. <laughs> Absolutely. I forgot about that. Yeah, get the colander. Um, you know, so it's just good fun. As I say, I squirmed in it with the breaking of legs and mm-hmm. knees and what have you. I thought that whole kind of the founder's pier with all the people on and them trying to find Sionis at the end was mm-hmm. really nicely done. And the booby trap fight was um fantabulous mm-hmm. uh you know for for this this movie so i i definitely recommend it um and yeah definitely really enjoyed it excellent excellent chris any final thoughts no i, I don't want to blow any more smoke up the crossbow um this it, this is fun it should be seen by everyone mm-hmm. it's a fun short what like hour and a hour 45 mm-hmm. it's succinct it's well written it's well directed um is it perfect no is any film perfect no um it it's just good it it's a good fantabulous ramp <laughs> a fantabulous ramp awesome ramp well since she's wearing roller skates she can fly then awesome exactly exactly <laughs> uh no it's just good i want to see where they go this i love margot robbie in this role mm-hmm. uh, like this character she has very much made her own she now is when when you think of, as I said, like when you think of the Joker, you think of Heath Ledger, or you now think of Joaquin Phoenix. They're all these very iconic versions. Mm-hmm. Um, when you think of, and personally in my case, I think of Mark Hamill, as I said earlier. Uh-huh. Not Jared Leto for some reason. What's going on here? I liked him. Mm-hmm. Me too. I it was a take. Did everyone like it? No. I liked it personally. Mm-hmm. Well, we all like Jared Leto. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 30 Seconds to Mars, baby. Uh-huh. My so-called life. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Requiem for a dream. He has never pulled off drug-addicted chic uh, better. <laughs> no, true. Or one hand, one-armedness. Um, <laughs> spoiler alert, I suppose. For Requiem for a dream. I, th- I think there's like a 15-year, oh, it's uh, fine. 15-year, like... It's, I, I get away with it. Um, no. But, uh, anyway, back to it. Yes, I completely love this film. Uh, I will be watching it again. Um, it, it's up there. It's in, definitely in my top three DC EU films at the moment. Excellent. Derek, what did you think? Tell us your thoughts. 
continue on <laughs> be succinct because we are already out of time absolutely absolutely no um i think i've said all of my thoughts here really enjoyed this as i said coming out of the cinema watching this i don't think this can be necessarily judged against any of the comic book movies that we've talked about before you know it's not it's not a comedy movie like deadpool which is the one that's most often compared to is oh it's an already comedy just like deadpool it's not like deadpool because it actually has a lot more going for it than Deadpool. Um, I, I find I've talked a lot about comedy movies not hitting with me, and that's mostly because they aim much more on the side of comedy than on the side of telling a good story with good characters. Um, I think this nails a really good balance in there. Uh, this is probably one of the one of my favorite films that I've seen in a while. Um, it felt like something brand new. It felt like something different. It felt like the the bad guys were very different than things that we've seen in every comic book movie where they get short shrift. Um, the all of the characters had really good storylines going on here despite the fact that it felt like you were in a harley quinn movie it, everybody had something to contribute to the movie so uh, I'd, I'd love to see more of these characters i hope we are going to see more and i hope a lot more people have gone to see this movie since uh, since we saw it and i hope more people keep going for the next uh, next couple of weeks that's in the cinema and if you don't discover it until it comes out on blu-ray or dvd um hopefully you've enjoyed it as much as we did in the cinema yes but gentlemen, on that note, we did ask for some feedback from our listeners over on facebook.com slash group slash TV podcast industries where you can leave feedback on any of the shows we cover. We always put up a spoiler post and ask you just to throw it in. To kick it off, Matthew DeBarger said, I liked it. I wish they'd gone more with the consistent goofy tone, having two of the best young actresses in Hollywood doing long, wide action sequences. is Great. John Wick light, but more funny. True. We, it's yeah. I don't know if Keanu Reeves can pull off the the funny and action at the same time, mm. but we'll have to see when Matrix Four comes out. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that could be hilarious. I don't know whether that's going to be that funny. Unfortunately. <laughs> oh, is that not Bill and Ted? The, the sequel to Bill and Ted, no. Ma- the Matrix Four. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, good point, Matthew. Uh, yeah, I must say, having these two fantastic, huge actresses now uh, doing fight sequences is really good fun. And you know, of course, you're going to get the guys on board from John Wick to do that as well. Um. So Liam McKisler also says, I saw it on Wednesday. There was more good than bad, but overall it was very uneven. Black Canary and Huntress were great, but underutilized. Make no mistake, this is definitely a Harley Quinn movie, not a Birds of Prey movie. The main antagonist was very weak, and I hate what they did with Victor's Az. As I said before, where have you gone, Anthony Carrigan? Very similar point about about Victor's as for me, Salim. I'm, I don't think the character was, uh, was as good uh, as we've seen in the past, and I think... In fact, actually, Anthony Carrigan's version of Victor's Az could have worked very well in yeah, this movie. Yeah, definitely. Considering he's kind of someone who does like anybody that's around him that he can fall in love with, really. You know, I think there's there's moments where he's fallen in love with uh, Detective Har- Harvey Bullock in uh, in Gotham. So, uh, so I'm sure uh, there's, he could absolutely have played that up uh, for the movie as well. Uh, thanks so much, Salim. Yeah, thanks, Salim. Uh, and thanks, Matthew. Claire Payne, uh, also on Facebook, goes... Just came out of the cinema. I loved it. Uh, there's a reaction. And we know that she loved it so much that she's going to see it again. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's. I think it is definitely a two viewer. I think you definitely watch it because it is just really good fun. Yeah. And Rebecca Hart, also on Facebook, said, I loved it. She goes, I hate Holly. Love Robbie. So I had concerns going in. I won't say any more because of spoilers, but just wanted to pipe up to give it some love. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, thank you so much, Rebecca and Claire. Uh, I think uh, this movie deserves a lot of love indeed. And we would definitely recommend that you go out and check out um, this phantasmagorical movie. Maybe that's the sequel. Birds of Prey in the Phantasmagorical movie. Uh, that's it. That is all our, our discussion for this episode and the first episode of Movies on TV Podcast Industries for the year. We'll be back in the cinema in May for Black Widow, starring Scarlett Johansson, directed by Kate Shortland. Really looking forward to seeing a bit more Black Widow, to be honest. Um, another Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, back up on screen again, so uh, looking forward to that. We are also continuing our coverage of Star Trek Picard. We'll be talking about Episode 4 later on this week. Uh, Star Trek Picard, you can get 
all of our podcasts over on tvpodcastindustries.com. Uh, subscribe to the Star Trek Picard podcast. The show's been really good. We've got three episodes so far that we've all really enjoyed. So uh, really looking forward to that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, been loving Picard and, of course, cannot wait for Black Widow. Uh, we'll also soon be going into the world of Penny Dreadful, where we will be looking retrospectively at the first three seasons uh, of the show as we lead up to uh, our coverage of Penny Dreadful City of Angels, which takes a slightly different tack from that gothic Victorian classic of the first three seasons and brings us right up to 1930s Art Deco uh, West Coast of America. That's coming out uh, on April 24th. Uh, and so we will lead our retrospective of Penny Dreadful Seasons 1 to 3 into that release date for the City of Angels. Absolutely. Really looking forward to that as well. If you want to support us and get early access to our discussions about Penny Dreadful, pop on over to patreon.com slash TV podcast industries. We'll be putting the episodes up there first um, for Penny Dreadful and then releasing them on our main feed uh, as we get closer to the release date of Penny Dreadful City of Angels. Yes. Help us uh, by keep the lights on with just that single dollar, single euro, single pound. Or you know what? You can also just share the love by sharing the podcast. Yes, exactly. You can support us in all ways that share the love indeed. Exactly. Lots of love, everybody. Enjoy Valentine's Day, whatever you're doing for it. Maybe you're going to go and see Harley Quinn and Birds of Prey again on Valentine's Day. I, I highly recommend that. Oh, I prefer, I suggest that they go to see Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of one Harley Quinn. Why not do a double header and watch both of them? There you go. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. We'll talk to you soon. As always, fellow puddings, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Remember, uh, don't be do good at dorks and come listen to us with the Penny Dreadful podcast, but also the darkness of space with our Star Trek Picard coverage. And of course, the even darker Black Widow, because it's in her name. <laughs> and after that, we'll speak with you again soon. Bye. 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 Welcome back to Movies on TV Podcast Industries. We're here with our spoiler-filled... Spoiler? Oh, God. Sean Connery. Spoiler. Spoiler. Yes. Well, I'd love to know what the subject matter of Dead Pigs uh, is, actually. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, no, that's... I'm uh, assuming as kind of... I was going to say equine? No. What's this? Poor sign. I, I'm assuming bovine and nope. death. Poor, poor sign. Bovine as cows. <laughs> That's your outtake there. <laughs> I'm assu assuming poor vine and kind of death. <laughs> if we're gonna say poor, poor sign, so poor vine. Uh, I'm assuming poor sign and death. Uh, Huntress is played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The crossbow killer. <laughs> Not the Huntress, it's the crossbow killer. But yes, yeah, she is played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead. They they call her the Huntress, she says to many, many people. She calls herself the Huntress. <laughs> no, hang on. It's Helena Bertinelli. Yes. So, okay. okay, well, that land is no, like... So you were so tentative, I thought you were, I thought you were correcting us. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> There's my outtake. <laughs>